have been stripped of their apparel. They go naked. And they have horrible faces. This is a quote from an early Jewish writing called The Book of the Cave of Treasures. It tells of fallen angels and their bastard children called the Nephilim. God destroyed the Nephilim's bodies and doomed them to wander the earth in an invisible dimension. And they are still terrifying men. In our modern paradigm, they are known as demon spirits. The word demon is from the Greek language and implies a supernatural knowledge. This demon knowledge is superior to our own knowledge. The Bible tells of their creation in Genesis chapter 6, and they were the cause of the destruction of life on earth. The Apocrypha and early Jewish writings expound on these evil spirits. The book of Enoch tells of their giant stature and how they manipulated the genetics of man and animals in every imaginable way. In other words, no stone was left unturned in their evil experiments. The answer to all this and the clue to this cosmic riddle may be found in the ancient book of Genesis. And back there in chapter 6, we are told of a very amazing and bizarre event. The sons of God saw the daughters of men and saw that they were beautiful and they lusted after them. And then we read they married them and sired children from them. For the past 1500 years, most scholars, including evangelical scholars, have interpreted the sons of God as the good sons of Seth, and the daughters of men as the wicked daughters of Cain. They've adopted that interpretation because the other one is so bizarre and outlandish. The ancient interpretation, and in my opinion the correct one, is that the sons of God were demonic beings or fallen angels and that they came down to earth, they lusted after the daughters of men, they married them, and produced this amazing progeny, this hybrid progeny of the Nephilim. And the very word Nephilim does not mean giants. It comes from the root Nephal, fallen ones. Edgar Mitchell, a former Apollo astronaut, went on the record on Kerrang! Radio, and after he sort of announced it on Kerrang! Radio several years back, I saw him again on the Fox News Channel with Sean Hannity on a sit-down one-on-one, and Edgar Mitchell's basically stating, look, Roswell was real, there was a crash, and bodies that were recovered from Roswell, and our government covered it up. Yes, there's not much question at all, but there's life throughout the universe. We're not alone in the universe at all. You're convinced that we're not alone in the universe? Oh, I'm no for sure we're not alone in the universe. And uh, I happen to be privileged enough to have... Uh, be in on the fact that we have been visited on this planet and the UFO phenomenon is real although it's been covered up by our governments for quite a long time. It is a real phenomenon and uh, there's quite a few of us that it's been well covered up by all of our governments uh, for the last 60 years or so uh, but slowly it's leaked out and some of us have privileged to have been briefed on some of it but I've also been in military circles and intelligence circles that knows beneath the surface of what has been uh, public knowledge that yes, we have a distance. He believes that, like I do, that there is a cover-up. We just have a d discrepancy in our world's view as to what we're really, what the, what's behind the phenomena. Again, he's extraterrestrial, I'm interdimensional, and specifically uh, the fallen ones, fallen angels, which we read about back in Genesis 6, once again manifesting on the earth. So there is evidence, there's plenty of evidence. Um, uh, we've got the witnesses. The popular documentary, Ancient Aliens, is trying its best to convince people aliens from other planets are responsible for the creation and evolution of mankind. They openly deny the God of the Bible while interpreting Bible passages in the same breath. I believe this is one of the deceptions Jesus alluded to concerning the end times, deceiving even the elect. The ancient alien theorists point to many artifacts and structures and claim these extraterrestrial aliens built them in the ancient past. I believe some of this is true, but these entities are not aliens from another planet. They are demonic spirits from an alternate universe, where they were sentenced by God. They are now disguising themselves as alien greys and are pretending to help man. Their spirit is also behind the transhumanism movement the altering of human DNA. 
Most people are not even aware of what is going on behind closed doors. Scientists are actively manipulating the genes of animals and man under the guise of improving humanity. We are shifting to a trans-human base. We've come out of a humanist time, and now we're redefining what it is to be human. Whether we like it or not, we're becoming cyborgs. We're becoming transhumans. We have the opportunity now to try to do things uh, better uh, than uh, nature has done. Why not have a stronger arm than we have? Or, you know, why not be able to run faster? Why not be able to have uh, tougher skins? If you're going to replace your eye for vision, uh, why limit it uh, to visual? Why not give it the kind of vision a bat has? give it ultrasound. Could you imagine a Versace body design? Can you imagine a Terry Muller body design? These individuals, the late Versace was an incredible designer. What if he was a transhuman? What if he was an artist who really wanted to combine art and science? I bet his designs for a future body would be astounding. So if we can humanize the pig kidney by putting in some human DNA, which will make the cells look a little, a little bit more human so that they are not rejected uh, by the person immediately then there's a better chance that you'll have a take and this is tried to humanize uh, animal tissues and it's becoming a big industry because we need more organs I think increasingly we're going to start realizing that this body is not sacred. The way we are is not some kind of God-given plan. It's really a pure random accident. We take two sets of genes and we shuffle them and something comes out. Sometimes it's a wonderful product, sometimes it has a hole in the heart, sometimes it has psychosis or uh, tendencies towards you know, extreme anger, uh, has addictive problems, can't concentrate, all kinds of de defects. To say, oh, that's normal, that's sacred, that's good, to me is rather absurd. It's just, it's random. There's not a plan there that we're thwarting. So genetic engineering seems to be one of the most moral things we can do. Wow, doublespeak at its best. This last man has completely reversed morality, saying transhumanism is the moral thing to do, when in fact it is the exact opposite, and the very thing the fallen angels and the Nephilim did in the days of Noah. All of these people believe in this delusion and are influenced because of their denial of God. The same is true with the ancient alien theorist. God sends a deluding influence so they will believe what is false, because they delight in their own evil will, as explained in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The idea around what we are doing in the genetics right now of humans, animals, plants, all, cease to, all seems to be an all-out assault on God's creative genius that goes back to that Genesis prophecy about the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman being set at odds one toward each other. And this is why, of course, Pandemonium's engine, why we gathered all of these scholars to address the various aspects of this issue, because in my opinion, nothing could be more prophetic. All of the Bible is all about genetics, the purity of genetics, and a war over genetics. Then it's a Mephistophelian bargain. It's it is. a deal with the devil. It's back to why we named the book Pandemonium's Engine, that deal that was struck uh, in, in Paradise Lost. Uh, ye shall be as gods, is whispered in the ears of humanity. And, um, but where does it take us now? I think we're seeing a repeat of ancient science. his power. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. The Science Channel's TV series, Through the Wormhole, is hosted by the beloved actor Morgan Freeman. In the episode, Can We Eliminate Evil?, Morgan Freeman says Satan doesn't exist. He is just a symbol, implying Christianity is for the weak-minded. Morgan Freeman, like so many others, lives in the delusion of his own will, and by denying the existence of Satan, he denies his creator as well. In the latter days, in part, will be distinguishable because of the rise of powers that have been suppressed or mm -hmm. repressed mm -hmm. over the years, mm -hmm. but 
in the latter days those powers will emerge once again. And one of our favorite verses uh, has to do with some some of the words of Jesus in Matthew 24, uh, starting in verse 36, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And what he's saying here is the days of Noah will be sort of transplanted into the latter-day era. Mm-hmm. And you and I both believe we're seeing that absolutely, right now. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, one of the, um, what, if, in my opinion, we're looking at the return of the Nephilim. Mm-hmm. It's a different uh, incursion than what happened thousands and thousands of years ago. I believe I call it the, the coming great deception. And what we're going to see is, or what we are seeing, is this manifestation of orbs and craft and, and other phenomena, other anomalies. Meanwhile, shows like the History Channel's Ancient Aliens yes. program is promulgating what I call the coming great deception. They're saying that E.T. created all life on this planet, that they genetically manipulated all life on this planet, that they started the world civilizations and religions, and now are coming back at this critical juncture in human history. Well, Christians in the church better wake up to what is happening, because this phenomenon is real burgeoning and not going away. Dr. Jacques Vallée has addressed the United Nations on UFOs and was the model for the Lacombe character in Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. He is the author of eight books about UFOs and has been widely recognized as the premier researcher in ufology. In his book, Messengers of Deception, he says, An impressive comparison can be made between UFO occupants and the popular conception of demons. In his book, Confrontations, he writes, The medical examinations to which abductees are said to be subjected often accompanied by sadistic sexual manipulation, is reminiscent of the medieval tales of encounters with demons. Jacques Vallée, at least at that time when he wrote that book, was an agnostic. Interesting that he comes to basically the same conclusions I do as a Christian from my research. And he said uh, about UFOs, they're real, but they're not physical. They're messengers of deception. And this was based on his research of about 20 years. In Close Encounters of the Third Kind, that first film that came out about UFOs, the house that the mother and and little boy were living in, you know, the toys began running around, the screws unscrewing them in the presence of UFOs. What the film was saying was the same people that run UFOs run haunted houses. And I would say that's absolutely true. John Keel was a world-renowned expert with unidentified flying objects and has written numerous articles and books on the subject. A self-described agnostic, he made this statement. Thousands of books have been written on the subject of demonology, which is the ancient and scholarly study of monsters and demons. The manifestations and occurrences described in this literature are identical to the UFO phenomenon. Victims of demonic possession suffer from the same medical and emotional symptoms as the UFO contactees. They have been stripped of their apparel. They go naked. And they have horrible faces. Just that the face is the eyes. They look horrible. And the eyes, the horrible look, had that information that you just told me? Most people, by default, ignore the idea of demons in our world. But if you have an encounter yourself, your life will change. Many people attribute their encounters as ghosts, paranormal activity, and UFOs. I hear people refer to a spirit as a dead relative watching over them. But most encounters have an evil nature. The majority of reports are based on emotions and misunderstandings. This is a contributing factor to disbelief. 
The truth is, the majority of people will not have an encounter strong enough to force the realization. This is something we should be thankful for. How could we possibly live day to day with the knowledge of something so horrible? When you encounter evil face to face, there is no escaping it. Anyone who has will tell you their life has changed forever. My own confrontation is directly responsible for my belief in God. And there's a contest between Satan and God for the souls of men. Their daily combat is the story that animates people's lives for centuries. The idea of one God is responsible for rewards and blessings. Sorrows and joys becomes very difficult. Perhaps God is not the singular God who causes all of the evil in the world. Perhaps there is another force at work. The Apocrypha and early Jewish writings have much to say about demons. I believe many of these writings have a core of truth, but it requires a certain amount of discernment. The Testament of Solomon is a very intriguing book. He is given a ring from God which grants him power over all demons. He then calls forth the leading demons to identify them. Jesus refers to these accounts and the power Solomon had over them. Sometime near the year 30 AD, a crowd gathers in a small village around the Lake Gennesaret. Here the residents of this Roman providence called Judea witness a miracle. In the process of healing a man, Jesus is accused of having a demon. In his rebuke, he refers to the testament of Solomon and says he has a greater power. This very statement gives legitimacy to the testament of Solomon. At least we know there is a core of truth here. He says this in the middle of an exorcism of demons. He says, for behold, someone greater than Solomon is here. Why doesn't he say greater than King David? No, greater than Solomon. Jesus is making an oblique reference to a story that was already well known in ancient Judea and which apparently people accepted as truth. The theme of demons in the Bible is very real. If you're not aware, then you are vulnerable. The amount of demons in this world is limited. The book of Baruch says there were 409,000, but there is no way to really know. The book of Jubilees says 10% of the demons were allowed to carry on with mankind. This means their actions are limited. The nature of demons is similar to the nature of people. Demons can be meek and they are vicious in every combination in between. The Jewish Midrash explains some of their qualities. Noah took demons into the ark and thus preserved their species. A demon named Og went with Noah to plant the vineyard and made a condition with him not to interfere in any way with his work or he would injure him. Demons are also known as the hairy ones, as the prophet describes in Isaiah chapter 13. The word means demoniac agency as well as flames. And when we are told that Pharaoh's magicians imitated Moses' performance of miracles, it means that they did this through the agency of demons. With the approaching dawn of day, the power of demons diminishes, their power being for the most part confined to night only. Religious men may gain power over demons and subdue them in various ways, as did King Solomon before his fall. Demons are always ready to injure man, but a sort of mask or thick veil is put before their faces, which tends to dim their sight so that they cannot look clearly at man. When, however, man sins, the image of God on him is reduced or eliminated, and this has the effect of lessening the dimness of the demon's sight so that he then has the power of injuring man by merely looking at him. Man is above everything, even over demons he can have dominion, but when he falls by sin, demons may take advantage over him. Tales from the Jewish Midrash. It is difficult to believe all of what the Midrash declares, but I do believe there are elements of truth within it. One intriguing description calls demons the hairy ones. As a matter of fact, the Midrash states one of the names of demons is hairy ones. The hairy demons have their own classification called serum. The powerful and vicious demon called Azael is one of these demons. Could this be a reference to Bigfoot? 
There are many references from other cultures about hairy demons, such as Inkadu from the Gilgamesh epic, Yeti, Sasquatch, the Chinese wild man, the forest man of Vietnam, and the Danish Grendel. A Persian demon called Ashma was a small hairy demon able to cause men to commit acts of cruelty. Every major culture around the world has legends of these creatures. They are described as tall and according to our own American Indian legends, evil. This could also provide an answer to why Bigfoot has been so evasive and why it shies away from man, seeming to vanish in thin air. Demons live in a parallel dimension and the Midras says their view of us is veiled. But man does have an authority over them. But they have an ability to appear and disappear from our reality, just like UFOs. Whether Bigfoot is actually one of the Serum demons is pure speculation, but a very tantalizing one. The New Testament leaves no doubt that those who believe in Christ have power over demons. But for those who don't believe, you are at their mercy, and most demons have no mercy at all. We should remember the majority of reports attributed to demons are based on misunderstanding, emotions, and commercial hype. Discernment is required. Why are UFOs, ghosts, and paranormal activity, and even Bigfoot so similar? They all have circumstantial evidence without any hard scientific proof. They seem to vanish in thin air. Numerous reports can be dismissed, but yet certain cases can. Some reports have a legitimate basis with credible witnesses. If these events are not going on, then what is? Is it just coincidence that all of these types of reports have the same circumstantial conditions? Or is there a common basis? I believe they are related and the entities responsible live in a dimension not visible to us. A dimension designed by God to prevent them from damaging our world like they did in the days of Noah. Enoch called them evil spirits and they became known as demons. They still have great knowledge and power to influence us. They are telepathic and can present themselves as aliens from another planet, a dead relative, or some form of ghost. They can cause objects to move and rooms to chill and are responsible for a host of other phenomena. The demons are subjected to man, but more so in regards of Christ. Another tale from the Midrash says some demons are afraid of other demons, and we can see a vast difference within their own kind. This offers an explanation for the diversity of hauntings and paranormal activity reported. The Midrash and the Testament of Solomon tell of some demons even helping man. Solomon used them for good when he had control over them. It is only by Christ that we have any control over them now. By a belief in Christ, the Son of God, you can order demons away, even the most fierce. The haunted houses and ghost stories you hear about are deceptive. Demons have a telepathic ability. They will appear as a dead relative if it gives them access. People who believe this, or believe it is a helping spirit, are being deceived. They are entertaining demons. As we have discussed, some demons are meek, but make no mistake, they are demons. The Apostle Paul says, it is appointed once for man to die and then judgment. In Luke chapter 16 verse 26, Jesus says there is an unpassable chasm between our world and those who have died. Man is not capable of coming back as a spirit. No one knows what hypnosis is. No one knows what goes on in the mind. It's an altered state of consciousness like yogis and uh, witch doctors have been practicing. Uh, it loosens the normal connection between your spirit and your brain and of course if the hypnotist can control you make all kinds of suggestions make you think uh, things are happening that are not happening make you think you have powers that you don't experiences that you haven't even implant memories uh, other beings if there are other minds out there they could also do the same thing Sir John Eccles, Nobel Prize winner for his research on the brain, describes the brain as, quote, a machine that a ghost can operate, unquote. What he means by that is your spirit operates your brain in a normal state of consciousness, in an altered state, reached under yoga, a TM, 
hypnosis, uh, you have loosened the normal connection between your spirit and your brain, and that allows another spirit, other entities, other minds to interpose themselves and begin to tick off the neurons in your brain, create a, a, a universe of illusion. I believe that it's demonic. I think all of the evidence indicates this. The modern reports of UFOs, alien greys, abductions, ghosts and spirits, and paranormal activity are all related to these demons of renown, the Nephilim. Because they are telepathic, they present themselves in different forms. They have access to your mind and anyone within your memory. Remember, Satan himself can appear as an angel of light, deceiving even the elect. Those who claim to have psychic abilities are opening their minds to demons. TV shows like Ghost Hunters, Paranormal State, and Psychic Investigators are playing with fire. Psychic Investigators claim these psychics communicate with dead victims and help the police catch the killer. Other shows attribute these spirits as some disgruntled person who died violently. This is a perfect example of how some demons will present themselves appearing as a dead victim to help solve a crime, or a relative pretending to give some type of guidance. They are desperate for human interaction. There are different types of demons. Some desire to help man, as described in the Midrash. Do not be deceived. I believe the form of the alien greys is their true form. Being stripped of their apparel, they go naked, and they have horrible faces. This sounds very much like the condition in which they were condemned by God. They are in the process of their last scheme, appearing to be friendly and willing to help mankind. Some scholars believe they will deceive the world against the return of Christ, painting him as an invading alien. Some of the passages that puzzle me the most in the scripture, it describes that the whole world is going to go to war against God. Now, I can understand the world rejecting God, I can understand the world not believing God, but somehow it's always been hard for me to visualize the world mustering its resources to go to war against God. That all, and yet that's clearly what it says in Psalm 2 and a number of other places. But you know, suddenly I could begin to understand how this might happen, because there are many people that believe that there are already aliens among us uh, conspiring with the government, whatever, and they visualize these as being the good guys. They're here to help us. They're here to give us advanced technology. They're people that really have this kind of attitude. I can begin to see uh, a, a scenario which we sometimes call good cop, bad cop kind of thing, where, the, where Satan's emissaries pose to be our friends to help prepare us for the bad guys who are coming. And, and uh, I can visualize the whole world being deceived and taking up arms against God, thinking that they're being led by the friends who are actually Satan's emissaries. At the end, in a place called Harmageddo, Christ comes to conquer the world. Jesus Christ, once the Lamb who was slain, is now the warrior king, defeating Satan and casting him into the lake of fire. He will then rule this world for 1,000 years. Seventy million people died during the Second World War. Thirteen million innocent civilians died in the German invasion of Russia. It's not even possible to comprehend these tragic numbers. All these war victims died never really understanding the truth behind the physical war. But a simple faith in God was enough. The deeper secrets of World War II were hidden because they were too incredible for the masses. The spiritual nature of this war was going on since the time of the patriarch Jared, the sixth generation from Adam. 99.9% .9 of the historians who recorded what happened during the World War never realized the truth at the very core. Yet there were a few who glimpsed an incredible truth, so amazing that they themselves could not even comprehend it. Others who gazed on incredible revelations were afraid to release the truth some fearing ridicule because the readers would never understand. 
thus suppressing it from the masses and educational institutions. It was too bizarre, sounding like something out of a science fiction movie. Yet these hidden secrets were too important and immense for us to ignore, and began leaking out through confiscated Nazi diaries, Nazi scientists, agents who gazed at secret documents, and witnesses who talked before taking their secret to their graves. Adolf Hitler had access to a higher intelligence than mankind. He explained it himself as divine voices. The German technology of UFOs is only now being understood by the public. Why haven't the average citizens of the 21st century heard this alternative version of World War II? Hitler may have answered this question himself. The real destiny of man is something the average man could not conceive and would be unable to stomach if given the chance. Our revolution is a final stage in an evolution that will end by abolishing history. My party members have no conception of the dreams that haunt my mind or of the grandiose edifice of which the foundations will have been laid before I die. The world has reached a pivotal point and will undergo an upheaval which you uninitiated people cannot understand. We've uncovered a never before seen secret location that can possibly explain the mystery between the Nazis and UFOs. It was something unconventional, some kind of a spacecraft. After the war, many of the German scientists went to New Mexico and became the basis of NASA. One of the key scientists, Hermann Olberg, said we were helped by people from other worlds. Did Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party have help from a higher knowledge than man? There are scholars and believers who now think they were guided by the alien grace of our modern UFO phenomenon. They insist these aliens have been visiting Earth for thousands of years. It's my opinion they have been here since the time of the patriarch Jared, as depicted in the Bible and the Apocrypha. They are not aliens from another planet, but are the children of fallen angels destined to live in a spiritual dimension on Earth. Today we call them demons. Many officers of Hitler's staff are on the record saying he was possessed by demons. Hitler himself describes it as divine providence. At the age of 17 he first heard their voices. In his book, Mein Kampf, he describes how a voice saved his life in a battle during World War I. The voice told him to get out of the trench, and seconds after he got out, a shell burst in the very spot, killing all those in the trench. He was now fully convinced he was divinely guided, and began his plan of ruling the world. If this theory is correct, we now know where that plan came from. It's also an explanation of why and how their technology surged ahead of the entire world. Hitler repeatedly escaped death, repeatedly escaped assassination attempts, and repeatedly attributed his miraculous survival to divine providence and the voice, which preserved him so he could fulfill his mandate and his destiny. Hitler's good friend, August Kubizek, also heard the voice which spoke through his mouth. As Kubizek later explained, it was like Adolf was possessed by a demon. The following is a quote by Gregor Strasser. Listening to Hitler, one suddenly has a vision of one who will lead mankind to glory. A light appears in a dark window. A gentleman with a comic little mustache turns into an archangel. The archangel flies away, and there is Hitler sitting down bathed in sweat with glassy eyes. Francis von Sett, ambassador from France to Nazi Germany, said he entered into a sort of mediumistic trance. Hitler was especially afraid of this entity at night. He would come for Hitler while he slept and dreamed. The German Vril Society is a society interested in what the Vril is. Vril is a notion of a superpower going beyond atomic power, something that has the, the ability to do all kinds of fantastic things, including those attributed to UFOs. At the end of World War I, where Germany was in, in abject defeat, it was of interest to German militarists as a possible source of power. The mediums in the Vril Society were saying that this force could be used to power craft. There were mediums that were doing exactly what? Okay, 
Generally speaking, mediumship is thought of in terms of communication with the dead. There's another group of mediums who channel material that is related to extraterrestrial or ultra-terrestrial beings and it claims that it comes from the science of these beings and that if we adapt that science, we will learn a great deal about higher technology than we have. Of course, the Nazis being interested in power quickly bought into that, and the more desperate the war became, the more they wanted to do aircraft in tune with these, uh, these mediums who were transmitting the, this material. They seemed to grasp the shape of these things, which was saucer-shaped or cigar-shaped, just as UFOs that are seen today. But they could never get the idea of the power that was involved in these things, because apparently, even though they used the name Vril Society, they never understood what the Vril actually meant. The exquisite medium, Maria Orsic, was the leader of the Vril, the beautiful young ladies of the Vril Gesselschaft. They all wore their hair in long horsetails, contrary to the popular short bob fashion of their day, claiming their long hair acted as cosmic antennas that helped facilitate the contact with extraterrestrials. Could the Vril women's long hair be the same attraction the fallen angels had with the daughters of men in Genesis chapter 6 and also the Book of Enoch? According to the legend of the German Vril Society, a fateful meeting was held in 1919 at an old hunting lodge near Birch's Garden, where Maria Orsic presented to a small group assembled from the Thule, Vril, and Black Sun societies telepathic messages she claimed to have received from an extraterrestrial civilization. One set of Maria's channeled transmissions was found to be in a secret German Templar script, unknown to her. A second series of transmissions appeared to be written in an ancient Eastern language, which Babylonian scholars associated with the Thule group, recognized as ancient Sumerian. Maria Orsic, along with Sigrun, another of the Vril Society's female mediums, began the task of translating these transmissions and discovered they contained instructions for building a circular flight machine. Upon studying these otherworldly esoteric designs, Dr. W. O. Schumann and his associates from the University of Munich realized the channeling actually contained viable physics, and over the ensuing years construction was initiated to make these flying machines a reality. By 1922, development of a working prototype was underway. Meanwhile, Germany saw the inception of the NS party and Adolf Hitler's rise to power, fueled in part by the utopian visions of a new world order inspired by the Thule and Vril societies. By 1934, the first manned test flight of the RFZ-1 took place. These ideas go hand in hand with Hermann Olberg's statement. We were helped by people from other worlds. However, these beings were not extraterrestrial. They were interterrestrial. The Nazis were obsessed with advancing their science by any means possible. The Nephilim spirits, as demons now, took full advantage of their desires and they were using Hitler and the Nazi party to gain rule over the world. They started feeding the Nazi party the technology to leap above the other world powers. And indeed, they were 25 years ahead. The saucer rose to the ceiling and remained there. I thought it was something extraordinary. It would never have crossed my mind. You know, I was only used to the idea of normal flying. Young Radu had just witnessed the world's first flying saucer. And this is how it works. If you draw air down onto a curved shape like a saucer, it follows the surface of that shape. By literally sucking the air from above his saucer so it flowed round and underneath, Koanda found he could both lower the air pressure above and raise it below, causing the craft to levitate. This became known as the Koanda effect. It's the principle at the heart of saucer flight. It was a very simple idea, but of course you had to have thought of it in the first place. There were as many as 15 prototypes that they built, tested, discarded, and went on to the next one. Yes, I saw it. 
For me, it was something exceptional. Round with the central cockpit made in plexiglass, and with jets all around it that made up the beams of the propulsion. Luigi Ramersa had seen the world's first production flying saucer, and it was a Skoda. Well, you see, the pilot drawn in the cockpit. The pilot would drive the disc standing up. This is one of the men who actually helped create that flying saucer. His name, Andreas Epp. Epp had invented a disc-shaped flying gunnery target and sent the prototype to the Luftwaffe High Command, suggesting it could be adapted for manned flight. In an interview recorded before his death in 1997, and never broadcast until now, Epp described how he began to suspect his designs had been stolen. I kept hearing reports that people in Prague were working on the construction of flying discs, and that progress was being made. Furious over being sidelined, Epp drove to the Prague test ground to find out what was going on. I had my Leica A camera with me, and suddenly I saw a flying saucer. It had no wings, absolutely none. I took a photo and wound on the film, but it was already directly over me. Then I took a second photo, and I could see it was a flying saucer. It actually flew and flew pretty, pretty well. This is what the German saucer looked like. It was based on the flying saucer principle, the effect discovered by Henry Coanda, whereby the ship created an area of low pressure above it and literally sucked itself into the air. But it combined this with other new technologies, such as the helicopter and the jet engine. It was fast, versatile, and could potentially carry a heavy payload of bombs underneath. These saucers worked in one sense almost like a helicopter in that they had rotating vanes. The vanes would rotate underneath the saucer and were powered by a jet, the same jet that moved the, the saucer forward, would be directed up to spinning these vanes to give it lift. They were to be used as a bomber. Every machine built in those years was a war weapon. What was to be the final battle of the Third Reich? There is an overwhelming amount of evidence of a German flying saucer. There is also much evidence and a paper trail to prove the Americans and Russians had successfully created their own saucers after the war. Perhaps the crash at Roswell was indeed a flying saucer. Los Alamos, White Sands and Red Canyon are all in the area of Roswell where the German scientists had been stationed. This would account for a small portion of UFO reports but they never mastered the propulsion engineering. Did the Nephilim spirits give this technology to the Germans, disguising themselves as aliens from another planet? The majority of Hitler's staff were not convinced. They are on the record saying Hitler was possessed by a demon. The pure Aryan race were the inhabitants of Atlantis. They were great in stature and had highly developed minds. This is the very description of the Nephilim, and both of these races claim they were destroyed by the Great Flood. The Nazi party was not only convinced they were descendants of this race, but set out to prove it. The Nazi archaeologists were searching worldwide to find traces of this race as proof of their claims. A branch of the SS was the uh, Ancestral Research Unit, which went all over Europe looking for remains of uh, Aryan ancestors who might still have purity about them. Uh, another thing they did was go to Tibet to see if they could find out how the Aryans had uh, conducted themselves, what they could learn about that. The whole thing strikes me as a farce. The, uh, the sight of uh, these SS people uh, in their uniforms with swastikas on their sleeves standing in the middle of Tibet looking for the master race. Just like the Nephilim, 
They were altering the genetics of man to produce this hybrid Aryan culture again. They were also murdering all those who didn't fit into their society. The occult groups that began in the late 19th century all talked about the coming of a messiah. And it, it very likely was Hess who suggested to him that he could now become the messiah that everybody was waiting for. The Nazi doctors at the death camps tortured men and women and children and did medical experiments of unspeakable horror during the Holocaust. Victims were put into pressure chambers, tested with drugs, castrated and frozen to death. The children were exposed to experimental surgeries performed without anesthesia. There were blood transfusions from one to another, isolation endurance and reaction to various stimuli. The doctors made injections with lethal germs and did sex change operations and removed organs and limbs. The angel of death, Joseph Mengele, carried out transfusions, sewed twins together, and castrated or sterilized them. Many twins had limbs removed in macabre procedures. Hitler was clearly ushering in a new religion. Uh, there would be a new man created and a new civilization. The Nephilim demons have always been performing these types of genetic and torturous experiments on man. They are the very reason the world was destroyed by water. Now as spirits, they were communicating these ideas to Hitler and the SS party. The Apocrypha and early Jewish writings tell of genetic manipulation by the Nephilim and their fathers, the fallen angels. Enoch says their imagination was the only limit. This explains the unspeakable atrocities performed by the Nazi party. The Nephilim are still performing these genetic alterations, but now they are known as alien greys, arriving from another planet and here to help man. I've had occasions where I've been able to communicate with them to an extent, uh, which is a mixture of them speaking in a sense that seems to be telepathic. Some even claim the Greys will often whisk their human prize away into space. An effort to create an offspring race that perhaps uh, had the best qualities of humanity and the best qualities of these alien beings. As you can see, the Nephilim are still trying to produce the great Aryan race. This idea was communicated to Hitler and the SS by the Psychic Vril Society. Helena Blavatsky and the Theosophical Religion were the main influence and foundation of the Vril and Thule societies. Helena had completely given her mind over to the spirit realm. She claimed to know the entire history of the world, saying the Aryan race was the undefiled race, descendants from Atlantis. This pure Aryan race was the Nephilim before their bodies were destroyed, the time before the Great Flood. Hitler and the SS embraced Theosophy, the Vril and Thule societies, and it became the compelling force behind the Nazi party. The Nephilim, now disguised as the alien greys, are here to help save the world from our own pollution. John Mack, the Pulitzer Prize winning professor from Harvard University, is a perfect example of this illusion. He claims the alien abductions are somehow related to a new hybrid human race, one which will help us save the world. Well, um, Elizabeth Satoris at the conference uh, said that if uh, one were to uh, put oneself in the position of an alien or some visitor from outer space and look at the Earth, they would see that what we were about was destroying the greenery and the life of the planet and making it into a desert. That seems to be what we're good at, or what we're doing. Um, so, the, it may be that, and I have some evidence for this from the communications that the aliens have brought to the people that I work with, who, who are, that those beings are very aware of this desertification of the planet, and they tell us, they show the people who have had these experiences, these incredibly beautiful images of the planet and it's you know like here at Novalinka, you know the flowers and the moss and the water and then they show that 
juxtaposed with scenes of utter destruction, forests destroyed by uh, acid rain, and rivers polluted where the fish won't live. And so they get the beings convey through those images, through the experiences, that we are in fact destroying life on the planet. They, they don't pull any punches about that. They're very direct in communicating that to as soon as the consciousness is opened up of the, through the experiences, then that, those, that information come, comes in. So it is very much related, in my view, to the ecological crisis that this is happening now. In fact, the Dalai Lama said something to that effect uh, in uh, 1992, where he... John he, Mack, he said, in his own words, embraced this deception. Do not be deceived like him. Christ is the Savior, not aliens who are really just demons in disguise. John Mack was killed in 1994 by a drunk driver. His life choices are now set for eternity. May God have mercy on his spirit. As we study the passages in the Bible that describe what we call the end times, it's interesting that one of the characteristics that shows up in Daniel 2 is that it says they will mingle themselves with, with, with the seed of men. Now, in order for them to mingle with the seed of men, the they have to be something other than the seed of men. So it's just a hint, but it's a profound hint that somehow in the end times there's going to be again some kind of commingling, some kind of intrusion into the genetic DNA makeup of people that's going to be a contaminant that would be part of the end times. And that's why. There's so much scholastic interest in this UFO business, in the abduction narratives and, and reports, and we may very well be being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in history, including the time of the Gospels when Jesus walked the shores of Galilee. Everything that happens on board is for a reason, everything is logical, everything is rational, and everything is understandable with enough information. This was not a learning experience, it wasn't an experiment, they were trying to figure out what makes us tick. The evidence suggested that this was a program. There is a reason for this program to be put in place. That's what the evidence clearly points to. What was happening was that people were talking about this reproductive material. People were having sperm taken, they were having eggs taken. People report that they were having embryos injected into them and uh, sometimes retrieved from them. What we conclude is that maybe these people are creating hybrids, creating a, a special race of people with DNA from us, human DNA, and with the alien DNA, creating people that are, I guess, more intelligent more sophisticated and I have heard other people tell me stories alluding to that effect. I began to hear accounts of abductees who were taken into a room and their attention would be directed to a screen-like device. And on the screen there would be a scene of normal human activity. A picnic, kids playing ball, Guys standing around a grill, people talking to each other. And they'll hear in their minds, can you tell the difference between you and us? And the person will look at the screen and say, huh? Uh, no, uh, everybody looks the same to me. You know? And they'll say, see, isn't that wonderful? Isn't that great? Soon we will all be together. 
Soon it will be wonderful. Soon everybody will be happy. Now, you hear that once, it's not a pattern. You hear that once, you just discard it. Interesting, who knows. But when you begin to hear it over and over again, then suddenly it has different meaning. This is from other people who are not aware of this testimony. Then I began to have a series of very bizarre accounts, but once again fitting patterns that people were saying, where they know that in the future they have a job to do. These are abductees. And the job is to um, stand on the corner and when panicked people come by to tell them it's okay, everything is all right, just keep moving, just keep moving this way, and they would practice that. And they would sort of do that, and they knew that in the future this is what they would have to do. And then I began to understand that what they were telling me, these abductees, what these beings were telling me, these abductees, is that ultimately this is an integration program into the society not with gray aliens most likely but with these hybrids who look quite human for years and years and years people would write to me and say oh well are adult hybrids walking among us and the answer is absolutely not there's no evidence whatsoever that that's the case but the evidence that I've been getting recently in terms of the goals of the program is that that might be the case. I don't really know yet. It is possible. And I, I am embarrassed even to say that. I'm embarrassed. And yet, it fits the pattern of all the evidence that I've been hearing for the past 20 years. It's focused on hybrids. The reproduction is to reproduce hybrids. And it does appear to be an integration program as crazy as that may sound. This is a technologically superior society by definition that we are seeing. And everything that is described is technologically superior. That is not the problem. The problem is that it's neurologically superior as well. They can control us neurologically and they can do it from a distance. That makes them superior. And the question is, how do you stop a superior species from integrating, from doing what they want to do? I don't know the answer to that. If it was a matter of shooting bullets at them or anything like that, it would, there'd be no problem. But the problems are much more difficult than you could ever imagine. And this will never be accepted as a reality until, until it is real. And then it's too late. I'm very, very not optimistic, shall we say, about the future of this. I fear for the future of my children, uh, both of whom are, are in their 20s now. And, uh, and I just think that they're not going to have a future the way they think that they are, in the way that I had hoped that they would. I'm very pessimistic about it. I, uh, I, I fear for the future. In summary, demons do exist and they are attempting to destroy what God has created. They have been doing this throughout the history of man and are the explanation for the evil in this world. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party are examples of their power and their presence. Demons are as different as people. There are some who actually desire to help us, desperate for human interaction. Some demons are terrified of other fierce demons. Their greatest deception is to make you think they don't exist. You must remember, they have a higher knowledge than man. Today, some of the demons are disguising themselves as alien greys from another planet. This is directly related to the UFO phenomenon and alien abductions. They are in the process of their last scheme to deceive the world, causing man to dismiss God as a myth denying the return of Christ. This last video clip reveals their presence and their agenda. In September 1994, over 60 children from this school in the suburbs of Harare, Zimbabwe, witnessed several objects landing and two beings coming out. Just over two months later, John and Dominique came to the scene to work with the children, their parents, and the teachers still suffering from shock. 
John, who essentially specialized in child psychiatry, devoted a great deal of time to interviewing the children. Something scared you, is that right? Yes. What, what scared you? The noise. What noise? The noise that we heard in the air. You heard a noise in the yes. air? What was it like? Like a roar or a buzz or a hum or what kind of a noise? It was like someone was playing a flute. It was scaring myself. It was scary because you saw something yourself? Yes. Mm -hmm. I saw a little object hovering. It was quite big actually. And then there was little ones all around it. We saw something silver and then we quickly ran to the loud to the logs and we saw a silver silver thing and we saw a man standing next to it. Uh, what was it, what did it feel like when he was looking at you? I felt scared. It, it felt scared? What was scary about it? Well, I felt scared because I've never seen such a person like that before. Did you see the eyes? What did they look like? They were um, going like that. Where was the pointy part? It was the pointy part in here, or was the pointy part okay. up there? Up there. And what was the feeling when you looked at the eyes? Um, it was scary. Mm -hmm. And what? Scary? Why? What made it scary? The eyes looked evil. Evil. Mm -hmm. And what was evil about them? Mm -hmm. Say what you mean by evil. <laughs> It looked evil because it was just staring at me. With what? Staring at you as if what? As if to do what? As if it wanted to come and take us. As if it wanted to come and take you. That was the feeling you got? That it wanted you to go with it? Did you feel like you wanted to go with it? No. Did you feel... What was the effect on you when, when you felt it wanted to have you go with it? Well, I just um, walked away and I started crying. They came running up here in such a panic. And, I mean, even if we had staged it, they could not have run all together like that. Even if we practiced it, I don't know how many times. <laughs> that they came up here like a living snake. And they just came... We were in a staff meeting and we just heard them screaming, screaming, ah, and then they were here, you know. And a child can't make that up. I was very skeptical in the beginning as well. Um, I believed that they'd seen something, but I wasn't prepared to accept that it was anything supernatural or anything like that. But I think the consistency of, of what's been going on indicates that it was more than I was prepared to admit in the beginning. So both of them were running. One was running um, in the trees, and the other one was running, running across the ship. Because mm -hmm. there were also trees here. Mm -hmm. The eyes were, were like more pointed as they came in toward the center of the yes. head, is that? No, yeah. more circular. And this was all black. All black. Now you've made pupils. Small. Did they actually have pupils or They're black? White. What? The pupils were white like that. And you saw white in the center? Yes, like that. Mm -hmm. Was he near the, uh, the silver object or was he far from? No, on top. On top of the silver yes. object. Okay. And um, did you look at him? Yes. Did he look at you? He gave me the creeps and I talked about it. Gave you the creeps. Actually, in your drawing, you showed him standing up, didn't you? Yes, I had to draw him standing up because I couldn't draw him sitting. <laughs> <laughs> what I thought was maybe the, the war was going to end. Maybe they were telling us the war was going to end. Um, well, why do you think they might want us to be scared? Mm. Because um, we, maybe because we never we don't look after the planet and the area properly. Mm -hmm. And let me. This is. Is this an idea that uh, you have had before that we don't look after the planet properly in the air, or did this idea come to you when you had this experience? When I had this experience. Mm -hmm. And how did that idea come to you from this experience? This is a little hard, but try, try to be with me here, okay? When you, how did this idea come to you when you had this experience? I 
I just felt all horrible inside. You felt horrible. At what point did you feel that? When you saw the craft or at, when you got home at night? Or when I got home. You had that horrible feeling when you got home? Yes. And say more about that horrible feeling, Lisa. What was it like? It was like in the world, all the trees will just go down and and there will be no air and people will be dying. Mm -hmm. And those thoughts came to you, had you had those thoughts before this experience? No. No. And did, how did those thoughts come to you? Did they come to you from the craft or from... From the man. The man. And the man, did the man say those things to you? Uh, how did he get that across to you? Well, he never said anything. It's just that the face is the eyes. What, what was the sense you got from those eyes? He was interested. They uh, describe these experiences or these events like a person talks about something that has happened to them. Uh, and when you're talking with a, a psychotic who's telling you something and it's a delusion and you feel that it really didn't happen, I can tell. I mean, I know this is something that a person wants me to believe or they're frightened or they're distorting reality in some way. There's nothing like that here. These are people of sound mind, by and large, uh, telling me something that's very... They know that I might think they're crazy and so they're a little concerned about telling me and and they, they're very full of questioning themselves and doubt and I mean the way and then they describe something very real and intense a light or something happened to their body or it, it, it's the whole quality of the way they talk about it is the way a person talks about experiences that happen to them. Do not be deceived. These aliens are leading people astray. Christ is returning for those who know him. And if you know him, you will recognize his return. This world will eventually be destroyed, not by our doing, but by the will of God. According to Revelations, we will reign with Christ for 1,000 years before the end of this world. Take comfort in his promise.